We're in Exodus chapter 2 this evening. We're going to consider verses 1 to 10. And I've got an introduction. I've got three points. My first point is the longest one. So don't get concerned if we've got to the end of point one and the clock has ticked on. I know you are not clock watches here, which is a good thing. Uh, but let's reflect on where we've got to uh, at this point in the book of Exodus. We have the sobering account of God's people. And we see that in chapter one, there's the genealogy of the names of the people that go down to Egypt. Pharaoh dies, who had given the people of God liberty and freedom in the land of Goshen. A new Pharaoh arises that does not know Joseph. And trouble is on the horizon. The people of God have grown and expanded and increased and multiplied. And Moses wants us to see that. And he underlines it again and again in, in chapter 1. And this is a sign of God's faithfulness to his promise and faithfulness to his people. The people grow and multiply in line with God's purpose, the faithfulness of the Lord. And we see the, the fears of a new Pharaoh, a new agenda. He's concerned that this people who have multiplied strangers to Egypt, not nationals, they will side with the enemy. They will be released. Labor and slave labor will be removed from the land. So he wants to prevent the people of God growing. So he enslaves them. He brings back breaking labor to them. And yet, chapter 1, verse 12, the more they are oppressed, the more they multiply. The unstoppable purposes of God. And we, we've seen how confirming and how powerful it is to know that our God will bring his kingdom, will protect his people, and the growth and future of the church of Jesus Christ is unstoppable, for the Savior himself will build his church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail. And so, there's a plan B. There's the ultimate final solution. The enforced Backbreaking slave labor is not working. The people are, are growing and they are multiplying. And so, one of the most wicked and evil plans ever devised by man is hatched to kill an entire generation of male baby boys. Uh, if Pharaoh succeeds, he will bring an end to the Jewish people. If he succeeds, the line of the Messiah will be no more. God's purpose will have failed and no saviour will come. His mistake, of course, is to bring his agenda against the plan and purpose of a sovereign God and we see the perverse nature of Pharaoh's plan in that he commands female midwives who are Hebrews to kill their own people. It's ludicrous. It's insane, isn't it? And that's the sinfulness of sin. It's often that way. It is insanity. But these midwives, they fear God. They esteem the smile and blessing of heaven greater value than the threats of a tyrant such as Pharaoh. And they refuse. And they do not commit infanticide. And so Pharaoh goes on to a further plan where he commands not the Hebrew midwives to kill these little baby boys, but to command his own people, the Egyptians, to kill these 
vulnerable little babies. And that's how chapter 1 ends at verse 22. That's the, the horror. That's the situation God's people find themselves in. If you like, uh, chapter 1 is like the general news broadcast. It's the update of the entire situation. These are the, are the headlines. You know, like you get on the BBC or Sky News, the broad brushstrokes of this is the issue, this is what's going on. Now when we get into chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, our passage is sort of zooming in. To stay with the, the news illustration, you've got the human interest to the big story. You've got the fortunes of one particular family and one particular baby who are, middle, who are living in the middle of this awful crisis. It's, you know, a bit like Hugh Edwards going uh, to uh, a Hebrew ghetto in the land of Goshen. The cameras are following him into a base slum house that belonged to Moses' parents. And by the way, Numbers 26, verse 59 we are told that the parents of Moses were called Amram and Jochebed, Jochebed being the wife. And we see this little family. They've just received back from the dead, as it were, their child. And they are rejoicing. And yet, all around them, there's the sound of heart-broken parents mourning the the loss, the cruel loss and slaughter of their children. Their sons haven't been saved. It's full of pathos and emotion and heartbreaking realities. Here we see the, the mystery of God's ways, don't we? It's amazing how Moses was rescued from certain death. And, and we, we focus on him, and rightly so. And we say, well, God was really at work there, wasn't he? But remember that there were many other Jewish baby boys who were killed and were not delivered. And this is the mystery of God's providence. He was still in control even in those times when those little babies were being brutally killed. We need to remember that even if we don't understand God's ways. And this is a mystery. And while our hearts should be stirred by the scene before us. We mustn't miss the lesson that God seeks to teach us in it nevertheless. That this is about his kingdom and his purpose. I'm going to highlight three key lessons from this passage. And we're going to see the faith in a faithful God, the faith of Moses' parents in a faithful God, and then, then the laughter of a sovereign God in reference in Psalm 2 in that context, and then the signs of a coming deliverer, not only Moses, but the one whom Moses actually points us to. So let's look at these points then in turn. Faith in a faithful God. Let's think about the faith of Moses parents, this covenant family, knowing that they could not kill their own son nor give him up to be killed by the Egyptian overloads. So Moses' parents protect him as long as they can. Verses 1 and 2 happen very quickly. Uh, there's a marriage, there's a birth, and then the child grows, and three months pass. Verse 2. And now they are unable to protect their child. Maybe it was like any baby. Moses was crying, and his cries could no longer be hidden. Perhaps it was the fact that Moses' mother couldn't stray too far away from the family home because of the responsibilities to look after the little baby. Maybe this arose suspicion. 
Whatever the reason, they could no longer conceal their child. They are unwilling to submit to the evil commands of Pharaoh. Because they fear God, they stand with the midwives in chapter 1, verse 17. And they do everything that is in their power to protect their child. And Hebrews 11, it's helpful if you turn there, verse 23, we have a wonderful Holy Spirit-inspired commentary on what is actually going on here. So Hebrews 11, verse 23, we read, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. They fear God more than they fear Pharaoh. That's what faith does to the true believer. There's an undergirding. There's a supernatural strengthening of a position where the believer says, I will not be moved. Here I stand. I can do no other, to quote the famous reformer. Now let's think about Hebrews 11 in the context of Exodus 2. We see three things about Amram and Jochebed, the parents of Moses. First, it is faith in the promises of God that underpinned their actions. What they did, they did by faith. In everything they do, in all of the disobedience of Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world at that time, they have faith in the promises of God, and this is what drives them. By faith, Moses was hidden. What a challenge, what an example that is to us. Does faith in God's promises drive you? Does it enable you to overcome your fears, anxieties, and doubts? Secondly, we, we are told in Hebrews eleven twenty three. 23, that there was something about Moses, he was beautiful, that garrisoned their faith. They saw that he was beautiful. Or Exodus chapter 2, verse 2, Moses' mother saw that he was a beautiful child. Now, you would probably argue that every mother looks at their child and says they, they're beautiful. But that's a very loose English translation. And I don't know Hebrew, so here I am relying on the commentators to help me. But we are told by the good commentators, but th this word beautiful, Moses has already used it. He's used it in the creation account in Genesis chapter 1, where repeatedly he gives this God's verdict on his creation that God saw that it was good. The Hebrew word there is tov, which is the same word that is used to describe Moses. And so there's something in the use of this word that shows a divine approval on Moses, whatever it was, whatever this beauty they, they saw in him, it was something that was showing God's approval. Matthew Henry argues that the beauty of Moses here is a precursor to the, the glory that would later shine from his face at Mount Sinai. Now, I, I don't know about that, but that's what he says. Amram and Jochebed trust God's promises and find in their sense something to strengthen and bolster their faith in God. And then the third thing that we see from Hebrews eleven twenty three tells us that it was faith in the future that helped them to overcome and expel their fear. We are told that they were not afraid of the king's command because they had faith 
in the ultimate sovereign, the King and Lord of heaven and earth, our God. It was compliance with the will of God and the word of God that informed their actions and made them say no to the command of Pharaoh and yes to following God, whatever that would result in for them. They abode to obey God because they believed his promises and they feared God rather than man or Pharaoh. Faithfulness at the risk of death. This is heroic faith. They are mentioned in the great chapter of faith, Hebrews 11. And so they find some way to protect their child. They hide him for three months. Then when this is impossible to carry on this arrangement, they find another way. The command was to throw the baby into the Nile. Well, literally, they have done this. <laughs> they, this is an ingenious way to protect the baby's life and obey the command, isn't it? They make a simple basket coat it with tar, make it watertight, place the sin in it, and he's cast into the Nile River. It's obeying the, the strict command. I wonder what they thought was going to happen to Moses. In their wildest dreams, they couldn't anticipate what would happen. Miriam, his big sister, is looking out for him hiding amongst the reeds, keeping watch on Moses. Maybe she thought she may be able to keep him safe there rather than at home. But whatever the case, can you imagine the knot in her stomach, the pounding of her heart as she sees, let me underline this, Pharaoh's daughter, yes, you heard me right, Pharaoh's daughter, of all people, comes down to the Nile to bathe. And we would say, well, there's coincidence. There's, there's lucky that happened. Well, far from it. God forbid we should ever use such language. This is a God-ordained encounter. She hears the baby cry, opens up the basket, and she sees the baby. Now, if we don't know the rest of the narrative, we would anticipate that, well, this is the end, surely. This is Pharaoh's daughter. She would be aware of the, the power and the, the rule of her father, what he'd commanded, the, the wickedness of that command. She'd, she'd know what kind of man he was. And the baby cries. If this was a a God ordained cry, this is it. And her heart is melted. And verse 6, this is one of the Hebrew children. Now, how does she know that? Well, obviously, logic would dictate that this would be a Hebrew child because he's in the River Nile. But the clincher would have been the simple fact Hebrew children, Hebrew boys, were circumcised in infancy whereas Egyptian males were not circumcised until puberty. This, unarguably, is a Hebrew baby. Now, do you understand what this means? Do you see what this is saying about Amram and Jochebed? They see around them baby boys being massacred. They still choose to put the sign of the covenant on their child, the identifying mark of a Jew. He's circumcised. A sign of God's covenant promise. And here they have faith in God that he will protect, that he will show mercy. They obey God under great pressure, and here they demonstrate faith 
and a great God. They entrust the care of this child to a, a great God and they are willing to obey at whatever the cost. And there are great applications for here. We are to trust the same God with our lives. Will he fail you? Will he forget you? Will he forsake you? The answer to these questions is found in that great hymn, The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Ultimately, we rest our faith upon the promises and faithfulness and reliability of our God of all grace. In preparation, I came across a, a beautiful phrase where one uh, modern writer was arguing that the people of God should be glad-hearted Calvinists. I thought that was a lovely and a beautiful poignant phrase. Now I think we would all be glad-hearted Calvinists when it comes to understanding our salvation. Praise God if you are, and if you're not, you should be. A glad-hearted Calvinist looks at their own heart, and if you like me, you see nothing to encourage you there or to make you believe that within yourself you would have the resources, the will, or the inclination to secure your own salvation. There is no way that you would have ever believed the gospel of grace apart from God's intervention in your life and the work of the Holy Spirit bringing new life to your soul. You know that and you rejoice in that precious truth. It's all of God from first to last. And yes, we are commanded to, to believe and trust in the Savior, but he is sovereign in this. He called you, he drew you by the gospel, he gave you new birth, he generated faith within you to rest on Christ, he saved you, and you believe it and rest in it and praise God for it. Glad-hearted Calvinists. But here it is where the rubber hits the road. Are we glad-hearted Calvinists when it comes to personal issues of family concerns, worries, and uncertainties about the future. There is a danger that in these issues, everything changes then. We think we've got to be in control. Uh, we want the assurance that it's going to work out how we have ordained it should be. Our Calvinism goes out the window then. We can be filled with fear and worried about our situations, about our futures. We are no longer trusting in the promises of God, but maybe looking for that silver bullet, that mechanism, that form of words, that strategy that will guarantee that the situation will be better as we want it to be. It's an illusion. Salv salvation, sovereign protection, provision belong to the Lord, not to our resources, not to our skill, not to any amount that we worry about a situation. The God who saves is able to keep, and he's more than able to bring us safely home. He must do it, he must save, and he is the object of our faith. That's how Amram and Jochebed did it. They fought off the fear of Pharaoh's evil command by faith in the promises of God. They obeyed God rather than men. And so here's the challenge to you. Do you fight off fear, anxiety, worry, by, pro by relying upon the promises of God? Because that's the position, biblically, you're meant to be. Okay, 25 minutes for the first point. Point number two, the laughter of a sovereign God. Pharaoh's daughter disobeys her father. Here's the irony. 
Pharaoh's daughter. She joins with the midwives from chapter 1 in disobeying the king for the sake of the people of God. She didn't know her crucial role in securing the future of God's people. She didn't know it. Nevertheless, this is the hand of a sovereign God. And it is beautifully ironic. This is the laughter of a sovereign God. This passage is dripping with irony. We've seen it already in chapter 1. The more the Hebrews are oppressed, the more Pharaoh tries to stamp them out, the more they multiply. The Hebrew midwives spare the Hebrew boys. When they're called to give account for it, they say, well, the Hebrew women are more lively, more vigorous than the Egyptian women in giving birth. And God blesses them despite the great opposition of Pharaoh. And here we see the laughter of a sovereign God. It is so clear to see, isn't it? Despite Pharaoh's evil, evil schemes, here is Pharaoh's daughter. And ironically, she gives Moses a name that means to draw out. And it will be Moses under the hand of God who will draw out the people of God from Egypt. He will be that instrument. God is sovereign. Here is the rock-solid assurance that we have a place to rest your faith. No matter how dark your situation is, God is sovereign. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What comforts there are in those three words, God is sovereign. Remember them. Live them out this week. And here we have an echo of Psalm 2 that I have already referenced. What evil men intend for evil, God intends for good. Psalm 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords from us. What is the response of heaven? It is glorious. He who sits in the heaven shall laugh, and he installs his holy king anyway. So we fight fear with faith in the promises of God and in the absolute sovereignty of God that he is able to keep his promises and preserve his people. In the end, the rage, the corporate gathered collective rage of the nations is contemptible and laughable. It is puny and it is ridiculous and of no avail. It is feeble and it is futile. So let faith in the sovereignty of God replace your fears with joy and a humble confidence in the Lord. Note I'm not saying you're amazing people and you've got amazing potential in yourself and it's all about you and go out of here and be bold and courageous in yourself. That's just a TED talk, isn't it? That's a pep talk. No, it is confidence not in ourselves but in him who is ever faithful, ever powerful and ever with us. God here is making a, a laughing stock of Pharaoh, isn't he? Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. The one enthroned in heaven laughs and says, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The Lord, the Lord reigns. And then thirdly, we're going to see there are signs, there are hints of a coming saviour. Let's see how this works out in, in review. First, we see that Moses' mother saw that her child was tov, was good. 
there's divine approval on this child. Secondly, the word for the basket which Moses is placed to in is, has been used before. It's actually the word that's used for the ark that Noah made. Obviously, this is a lot smaller, this little, literally Moses' basket, but it's the same word. And it's an ark that Moses is placed into. Moses, like Noah, through building the ark, will be a savior of his people. He will deliver them from the wrath of Pharaoh as he's the instrument in instituting the Passover and the people are rescued. Pharaoh's daughter pays Moses' mother to nurse her own son. Now this would have appealed to the Hebrew sense of humor. They would have been reminded of the irony of this because when they finally leave Egypt, remember what the Egyptians did for them? They give them gold and, and silver and precious stones to leave. And here we have the, the irony of Moses' mother being paid by Pharaoh's daughter to do that which she would naturally love to do. And here we have Moses, his name means to draw out. And that's his destiny. He's not only drawn out of the water, but he's going to be the instrument to draw the people out of Egypt to be God's people. And we put it all together, and we've got this slave in Egypt, saved through the water, plunders the Egyptians, makes them a laughing stock of Pharaoh. And we'll see that next week he goes on to spend 40 years in the wilderness of Sinai. This is Israel's story in miniature, played out in advance in the life of one man. It's very interesting, isn't it? These aren't coincidences. These are, are God-ordained patterns that we see the future of Israel being replayed in miniature in the life of Moses. And he, of course, is pointing beyond himself to the greater deliverer. It's a preview of what God is going to do for his people through his son. God's saviour, his appointed deliverer, is the representative of his people. His destiny is going to be the precursor of their destiny. He's the author and pioneer of faith. Where he goes that way, their path will lead. And as Moses is this type of Christ pointing to our Savior, we see what it means to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus acts for us. And as he does, as he represents us, his life, his story, becomes our story as we believe and trust in him. He obeyed for us. He lived for us in this sinful, broken world and never once sinned. He died for us, as we saw this morning. He rose in victory for us. He ascended to glory for us. And he will come to bring us home so that we will be where he is also. Jesus' life tracks our destiny. Moses was the deliverer of Israel from bondage of the Egyptian slavery. And so Jesus is our great deliverer. And his deliverance will not just be for one people group in a small part of the Middle East. No, it will be for every tribe, every nation, every people group. All who trust and believe in him are saved and rescued and are, of course, qualified, delivered, and redeemed. You've heard those words somewhere else before, haven't you? Moses points us to 
to Jesus. And he is where our identity and our destiny lies. And we rest in such a saviour and we, we trust him with our lives. And we are glad-hearted Calvinists, not only when it comes to the means and way of salvation, but in the everyday moments of our lives. Tomorrow morning, Wednesday afternoon, Friday evening, when you can be in the heat of the battle, you fight fear by resting in a sovereign God and trusting in his promises. Are you resting in such a mighty deliverer tonight? Is it well with your soul? Have you peace in the Savior? Fear him, ye saints, and you shall have nothing else to fear. Let's pray as we close. Now, Father in heaven, we give you thanks that you've provided such a, a mighty Savior in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you would be pleased to draw us closer to him in faith and obedience. We pray that we would trust him not only with our salvation, but with our entire lives. We pray that your promises would be so real to us that we would overcome fear and doubt and anxiety and be able to trust in your sovereignty. We pray that we would be found resting upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that we are in him and his story, his life is ours and we are in him. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Well, hymn 799 is where we close tonight. Jesus, our best beloved friend, draw out our souls in pure desire. Jesus, in love to us descend, baptize us with thy spirit's fire.